My name is Tom McCall. I teach uh, Biblical and Systematic Theology here at Trinity. I also help serve as one of the moderators of the Scripture and Ministry Series for the Henry Center for Theological Understanding. We're very grateful to have all of you here today. And just as a note to you, so you can stay apprised of future events with the Henry Center, there are sign-up cards um, on many of the seats. There's also a sign-up sheet at the Henry Center table in the back. If you wish to be included on a mailing list, um, you can give your pertinent information here, drop that off at the table on the way out, or sign one of the sheets that are on the um, benches here, and um, we'll be sure and get you included and so you're apprised of further events. We are honored to have with us today Dr. Dallas Willard, Professor of Philosophy at University of Southern California, better known to some of us perhaps as a speaker and author. In philosophy, he's perhaps most well known for his work on Husserl, including extensive translations of many of Husserl's early writings from German to English. Probably better known to many of us for his award-winning books, perhaps most notably his book, Renovation of the Heart, The Divine Conspiracy, Spirit of the Disciplines, more recently, his edited work, A Place for Truth, and his Knowing Christ Today. We're really honored to have him here and grateful to have all of you here. Far beyond that, we're very grateful to have the presence of the Holy One with us today. So we will begin by praying together. Let us pray. Lord, in a world that is rocked by hatred and strife, torn apart by sin and its devastating effects, we're truly grateful that you bring us together. We're thankful for your work in our lives. And Lord, we find ourselves hungry to know more about that, to experience the way that that transforms lives, families, entire communities, and destinies. And we pray, Lord, that we will learn more of that today. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Join me in welcoming Dr. Dallas Willard. Thank you very much uh, for that warm welcome, and thank you for coming. Um, I have a sense of your practical interest in this subject, as well as your intellectual concerns about how to make sense of it. And so I'm delighted to have a chance to talk to you today about transforming or being transformed by the renewing of the mind and the use of scripture in spiritual formation. I, I started to say I can't, of course you can, but I, I don't want to avoid saying a word of appreciation about Carl Henry. Um, I was raised way back in the woods and uh, there was a time when in the mail there came a ragged little publication called Christianity Today. It was uh, in simple newsprint folded over, but it had some of the most helpful and profound things in it. And one of the great periods in evangelical theology. I never knew him personally, but it, I've, beyond hearing him speak and in his writings, but I feel like that uh, I am privileged to be in any way involved in something sponsored on his behalf. Now, since this is on the use of scripture, I think I will take a text. And it will be from the 12th chapter of Romans. You know it without looking at it. I urge you, therefore, brethren, 
as Paul says, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your reasonable service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. Now call your attention to some wording there. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We're going to have to do a little anthropology today uh, because we want to understand the role of the mind in spiritual transformation. I do want to say that this is not an academic subject for me, though it is an academic subject. I'm constantly involved, both in my own local fellowship and in many conferences and churches, with this issue of transformation. There is, of course, a widespread sense that it isn't happening. Now, I'm going to say things you may disagree with, and you're going to have a time when I stop talking to straighten me out, and I hope that you will, you will take that seriously, and I, I assure you I will take it seriously. And I don't like to exaggerate, but I think over our churches generally today, there hangs a cloud of failure. Whether it is an illusion or a reality, I'm, I leave it for discussion. But there is a widespread sense of failure. And this is often driven home by statistical studies or other ways of trying to come to grips with what the public sees of the church in terms of failures of its leaders but also a lack of transforming power of Christians in our society. So I'm constantly trying to help individuals and groups who are or seem to be stalled out in the sense that they are not seeing the kind of transformation in lives that you might pick up just from reading the New Testament. It's very interesting to see how the secular world often beats up on the church with the church's own stick. That is to say, uh, trying to apply, well, not oh, often in almost bizarre ways, but trying to apply the standards of righteousness that they have picked up somehow from Jesus Christ uh, to uh, the behavior of the church. So. Um, I'm concerned about that. Let me say next, I do not think there is anything that can replace the church. I think uh, that what you hear about people trying to do something different is generally ill-advised and is not likely to happen. On the other hand, I believe that we can do much better and I believe firmly that there's nothing wrong with the church that a clear-minded, resolute application of discipleship to Jesus Christ would not cure. And that we have fallen into a period where discipleship is not the norm and not much understood. So we have the accepted situation of multitudes of Christians who are by their own admission often not disciples of Jesus. Now, if that's the situation you have, then the remedy is to turn to discipleship. And if you turn to discipleship, then you're going to be turning to means. And we're talking about scripture as a means to personal transformation today. Paul admonishes us in this passage not to be conformed to the world. That's the option. Not to be conformed to the world, but be transformed. And how? 
by the renewing of the mind. And I'm hoping that I can at least give us a little better grip on what that might mean today and how it relates to the use of scripture in ministry. The old mind holds before it a certain picture of reality. And its workings, the workings of that mind, are tied to how they think the world works. The new or renewed mind goes with transformation into conformity with God's world, that is, the kingdom of God. So the transformation we're talking about is out of conformity to a way of occupying the mind and using the mind into a different conformity, a conformity with God's world, the kingdom of God, with thinking conformed to the realities of the kingdom of God. So let that be my first attempted point. We are talking about an alternative reality. The world on the one hand and the kingdom of God on the other. They have different views of the things that matter most. And of course the scripture comes to help us master not just intellectually, but practically, life in the kingdom of God. That is what it is all about, in my opinion. What is the kingdom of God? Uh, let me say, and you can say back when your turn comes, that the kingdom of God is the range of God's effective will. It's the range of God's effective will. It's where what God wants done is done. We pray, thy kingdom come. And we spell that out, thy will be done. On earth, which is the only place that the kingdom of God is not, and actually it is here, but there are other kingdoms here that conflict with it. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. All of the problems of humanity come from thinking wrongly about God. And for that reason, his name is not held to be a beautiful, sacred, wonderful thing. The importance of that is why I believe Jesus puts that first in his model prayer right after recognition our Father who art in heaven comes the first request hallowed be thy name and when you get that right then everything else follows from that now the contrast to that of course is the world the world is organized around human desire that is why John says, love not the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. What's in the world? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three things. They are all expressions of human desire. The will of God is directed towards what is good, not towards what is desired. Love is not the same thing as desire. Love is meant to govern the will which contemplates alternatives. Desire contemplates an object and says, I want that. Desire is obsessive, it is blind. It is, as Paul says, deceitful in Ephesians 4. 17, I think it is, the deceitful lust. Lust, desire, is always deceitful because it promises satisfaction and fulfillment if it gets its way. 